power of the gospel. Did you hear what that young man said? His grandmother passed away. He was in a dark spot. He was talking to a friend. A friend took him to the Bible study. And at the Bible study, there was a man that, that sat down and he started drawing three circles. And he said, I thought this man was insane. You know, I think we all can relate to that because do you ever feel like sometimes when you open up your mouth to share the gospel that maybe these people aren't going to think receive it or, or maybe you might think they're the most unlikely person that would ever trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But can I tell you something this morning? There is power in the truth of God's word. Listen, it's not the, the three circles. There's nothing magical about them. It's the truth. The fact that God has a design and a plan for all of us, but because of sin, we are broken. And brokenness relates to every single human being in the face of this world. And I love what we've sung about this morning, the victory that we have in Christ, the healing that we have in Christ, the fact that we have strength, we have a rock, and we have a redeemer, and that resonates and that speaks to our hearts because we are broken, and Jesus Christ is the answer. And there is power in the truth of God's word, and there is power in the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that young man, sitting under the truth and hearing the truth of God's word, got saved, There's power in the gospel. Don't ever underestimate what God can do with the truth that sometimes we so often take for granted. The second thing I noticed in that video that I really loved was a transformed life. I've watched that a whole bunch of times, and every single time when he gets to the end of that video, he says, if God wants me to be a professional football player, well, that's fine and dandy. I loved how he said that. It's fine and dandy. If that's what God wants for me, great. But regardless of that, if he can use me to share the good news with others, that, that's where we need to be in our lives right there. And can I, can I tell you something? God does want to use all of you. He's got a plan. He's got a specific purpose. You've got, um, you've got skills and abilities and talents that God's given you that he wants to use for his honor and glory. But ultimately, what God has in store for all of us is that we go spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and we share the good news of him with a world that is lost and dying around us. And so before I jump into the message, I just want to encourage you. Last week, we started a small group study in all of our connect groups called the three circles. God's design and the three, all it is. Listen, it's just another tool. It's just another method to get the gospel out there. It's just about stretching ourselves and challenging ourselves and giving ourselves accountability at the reality and the need that we have to take everyday conversations and turn them into gospel conversations. If you want to take a next step, you want God to use you, I challenge you, get in a connect group. It's not too late. Get a part of the study. Open up your heart and your life to God using you. And we're going to come back to that at the end. But that leads us right to where we're at here in Romans chapter 10 this morning. We are continuing with our series we started a few weeks ago, Let There Be Light. Get plugged into God's plan of salvation, and the title of this morning's message is this, God's brilliantly simple plan. God's brilliantly simple plan. Back in the fall, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Las Vegas to um, speak at a church and at a school and to do some leadership training with their staff out there, and we had a wonderful time. And before we left, we had One of the highlights of last year, we had an awesome opportunity to go to a fine dining restaurant experience. We went to the Bedford. It's by Martha Stewart. It was down on the Strip. It was a really nice restaurant. And man, that night was awesome. The food was amazing. And if you're having a good night and you're splurging on food, you got to end with dessert. That just tops it all off, right? You got to put that icing on the cake and just end it. And so I'm a chocolate guy. And my, normally my go-to dessert is I like anything that's chocolate or anything that you can warm up and put some vanilla ice cream with. That's how I like to end the night. But there's one thing that will top desserts, top all those desserts. I ask for my wife to make it every year for my birthday. And my mom, every year when I go home for Christmas, I ask for this. And that is a lemon meringue pie. And all God's children said, I love a lemon meringue pie. On the menu... On the menu was an upside down lemon meringue pie. Well, that instantly caught my attention. I was like, I'm going to get lemon meringue to top this night off. Can it get any better? And upside down, that sounded intriguing. I mean, we're at a restaurant with a real chef. And so, you know, this is going to be extra special. And I don't, I don't really know what I was expecting. Maybe like a brown crust on top. I don't know what I was expecting. But what they brought out to me 
was not it. Now, go ahead and put the picture up. That's the dessert right there. Now, I got to tell you, when I, when I saw that inside, I didn't say anything that night. I, didn't, I mean, we're having a good time with our friends. I didn't say anything. But when I saw that in my heart, I was disappointed. <laughs> that was not what I was expecting. I don't like white desserts. I just don't. That's not my flavor profile. And I was like, and for whatever reason, I thought, man, that's probably going to be crunchy. And I don't even see any lemon. I'm sure it's in there. But I was just like, this is going to be a letdown. But you know what? Dessert is dessert. It's like pizza, folks. There's pizza. There's good pizza. There's bad pizza. But at the end of the day, it's pizza, right? What do you do? You eat it. (laughs) Same thing. I'm not going to pass up on a dessert, even if it doesn't look that appealing to me. So I took a bite. And when I took a bite, oh, my goodness, it was the most, one of the most. It's really bad if that's that extreme with food. But it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. It was not at all what I thought. I mean, I was disappointed, and then I was thrilled out of my mind. I was just excited. I was like, I mean, everything just worked perfectly together, and the lemon inside, oh my goodness, it was just, oh, it was doing things that were just amazing. What a way to finish and end the night right there. How many of you wish you could go experience something like that right now? Okay. Fly to Las Vegas and go to the Bedford. All right. You know what was amazing about that is that is a brilliantly simple concept right there. It's basically three elements to that. You know what the upside down lemon meringue pie is? It's a, you take the meringue and you make that a crust. So that bottom layer of white right there, those circles, is meringue. And it's put into the crust and then they put this lemon curd cream in the middle. And then the top layer is just homemade whipped cream. And I'll tell you what, it's a simple concept. I mean, she's got it in her recipe books. Anybody can make it at home, might not have that same presentation. A brilliantly simple concept that was absolutely amazing. Can I tell you this morning, the gospel, the good news, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You know what the gospel is? The gospel is Christ. The gospel is Jesus. And the context that we're in here in Romans 9 through 11, Paul is writing about the Jewish people. And when they saw Christ, when they saw the Messiah, they were disappointed. He was not at all what they were expecting. And Isaiah 53 tells us about this. I mean, Isaiah predicted that because he said in Isaiah that he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The Jews were expecting their Messiah to come as a king. And they were expecting him to come conquering and with a sword and with power and with authority. But God decided to send his son in the form of a servant as a human being. And God in the flesh was still standing right in front of him, but they were so disappointed because he was not at all what they were expecting. And instead of diving in, and instead of taking the leap of faith and trusting and having their eyes opened to the truth, they rejected him. They crucified him. They walked away from him. And you know what happened as a result? They missed out on one of the greatest opportunities and experiences of their life. They missed out on the greatest need of their life, and that need was for salvation. Before we move any further, I want us all to understand this morning, we're going to be talking about God's brilliantly simple plan of salvation, This world needs Jesus. We needed Jesus. Where would we be if we were not saved? We would be lost. We would be doomed. We would be heading to an eternity in hell separated from God forever. We cannot miss out on God's plan for salvation. Now, I want you to understand before I dive into this and before I jump in, please don't sit here this morning and think, oh, this is just a gospel message and I do not need it if you have been saved for a long time. No, this is is a gospel message. The gospel is going to be presented clearly. I'm praying that it's going to be presented clearly. But there is so much in there for every single one of us as believers that needs to sink deep into our hearts and deep into our souls that we cannot afford to miss. And what I want to do before I move any further this morning is I would like everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes because I want God to use this message today to speak to us. Father, 
we come before you, and before we go any further into your word, I pray that our hearts would be humble and in the right place to receive your word. And I pray that you would take it today and do in every single individual's heart and life exactly what needs to be done. And I pray that we would leave here today changed. Lord, if there's a person here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, which I'm sure that there is in a room like this, today help them to see you and to put their faith and trust in you. Lord, for those of us who are believers, I pray that we would realize what we have and the responsibility that we have since we know you and since we know your plan for salvation. And Lord, I pray that you would, again, change us and use us to continue to share the good news that the world is so desperately in need of. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And to all God's people said. All right, let's dive right in. The first thing that I want us to see, by the way, this is a simple outline, okay? God's brilliantly simple plan. It's righteousness by faith, faith by hearing, hearing by proclaiming. That's going to be the outline that we're talking about, okay? It's simple, but there's so many amazing layers to it. Look at verse 1 of Romans chapter 10. He says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I love that these chapters are infused with the burden that Paul has for people to be saved. And not just people, his brethren, God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. And do you understand what Paul's saying? The nation of Israel, God's chosen people, they're lost. They're not saved. Man, this was earth shattering. This was almost something unthinkable and unspeakable, especially in his context. And as a result of that, his burden and his prayer to the point where there's a great heaviness and a continual sorrow. Man, it permeates all of this. Before we go further, there's got to be that burden that permeates inside of our heart. The thought that there are people that are lost, that there are people that are not saved, that need Jesus Christ. And eternity is, that, is what's at stake. Let that just permeate your heart and your soul. Then in verse 2 he says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Man, these people, they had a zeal for God. They were so close. Just like so many people in our world today. But their zeal of God, it was not according to knowledge. They were close but yet they were so unbelievably far away. And the problem was this. They had the wrong righteousness. They had the wrong righteousness. Now look at verse 3, and you all are going to help me out with verse 3. I'm going to pause three different times, and you're going to say that word, okay? So everybody, verse 3, you can put it up on the screen. It says this. For they being ignorant of God's and going about to establish their own have not submitted themselves unto the of God. Three times in this verse, you run across the word righteousness. Can I tell you this morning that righteousness matters? Righteousness matters. The only way that we can stand before a holy and righteous God is if you and I are righteous. Unrighteous sinners will not be able to spend eternity in God's presence. Unrighteous sinners cannot have an intimate relationship with God because God is holy and God is righteous and only righteous people can enter into his presence. Righteousness matters. This is an extremely big deal. He says in the beginning of that verse, he says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. The Jewish people were ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, I want you to think about this, and on the surface, were the Jewish people really ignorant of God's righteousness? And the answer to that is no. On one hand, no, they, they knew God. They knew his righteousness. They knew his holiness. If you read through the Old Testament and you take all of this in context with Scripture, you will see that the Jews had an up and down, in and out, crazy relationship with God. Not because God's crazy. God's faithful and he's steady. But the Jewish people, human nature, were up and down and all around in our relationship with God. And they're going in and out of idolatry. And in spite of all that, God blessed them and God's patient with them and God's long-suffering with them. But finally, after years of stubbornness and after prophet after prophet warned them, 
God allowed them to be taken over by the Babylonians. He removed them from their land. He took them into captivity for 70 years, but then God in his mercy and his kindness after 70 years lets them go back into the promised land. And here we are, we're 400 years after this. Jesus shows up on the scene, and honestly, the Jewish people had been cured of their idolatry. For the past 400 years, they were worshiping the one true God. They were following the sacrificial system. They were obeying the laws. They knew God. They knew his righteousness. And yet it says here that they were ignorant. They could not rationally understand God's righteousness and what God wanted ultimately from them made absolutely no sense to them. They were ignorant by choice. They were ignorant because of their own hard-heartedness. And instead of submitting to God's righteousness, you know what they did? They went out and they established their own righteousness. That's what it says. And going about to establish their own righteousness. Man, they religiously followed the law. They memorized the word of God. Man, they took it literally. If it said to put frontlets in front of their eyes, I mean, they put it in front of their eyes. They attached it to their bodies. They hung it in their homes. I mean, they knew God's word. They debated it inside and out. They knew exactly how many laws there were given in the Old Testament. They would debate which is the greatest of all of these. Still to this day, they religiously follow the law. If you were to go to Israel today, just one practical example. And you were there on the Sabbath day and you were staying in a hotel. You would not have to push a single button. On the Sabbath day, they, they set all the buttons. And if you had to go to the 21st floor of a hotel in Jerusalem, you're going to have to stop at every single floor on the way up because they put all these precautions in place. Their heart, they didn't want to not just obey God's law. They didn't even want to put themselves close to disobeying it. So they added all kinds of extra things that would protect them from even coming close to violating the law that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. The problem is this was never what the law was all about. You know what God isn't looking for? God isn't looking for good people. Self-righteousness is the wrong righteousness because you know why? There's no such thing. There's no such thing as self-righteousness. My righteousness, the Bible tells me, is as filthy rags. And we already saw earlier in Romans that there is none righteous, no, not one. We are all sinners. We all fall short of God's glory. Now, to hopefully to illustrate this in a way that makes sense, I'm going to use myself. I clean up pretty nice, don't I? <laughs> Man, I got layers on today. Look, I think I got a nice little outfit. Atlanta did a good job. Give Atlanta a good round of applause. Man, she dressed me up this morning. I'm looking pretty good. You know, I, t Saturday mornings I trim up my beard, and on the outside I make sure that I, I get all... All nice, I make sure my hair looks as good on Sunday as any other day out of the week. But even more than that, you know what else I did? This morning I got up early, went on a walk, been praying, been saturating my heart and mind in God's word. I'm up here this morning, I'm preaching the truth of God's word. Man, if you want to back up into this weekend, I did something really good this weekend. I, I went to the couples refresher at West Florida Baptist Church. I listened to Pastor Shetler. I realized that one of the things that my wife needs is she needs me to help her make her house a home. I vacuumed my floors yesterday. I went and did battle with her. I went to my boys and told them they had to clean their bathrooms and the shower. That's a battle, let me tell you. I didn't lose my temper. I stayed under, nobody did. Yesterday, my boys were, they were even good yesterday, man. Everybody just worked together. We had a really nice day. We had a really nice night. And you know what? I could sit up here and I could tell you on and on about how good I am. And you know what you'd start doing? You would start squirming. You'd start getting uncomfortable. You might even be right now because there's just something that's wrong about that, right? There's something off-putting because no matter how good I may look on the outside and no matter what kind of pedestal you might want to put me on, I know who I am and I am a sinner and I'm broken and I got struggles, and I got issues, and no one is shaking their head harder right now than my wife sitting on the front row. She's like, yes, that is absolutely true. You understand what I'm saying? I'm looking at a room full of good people by the world standards, model citizens, 
People that really, truly make a difference. Self-righteousness is the wrong righteousness because there's no such thing. We are all broken. We are all guilty. We are all undone. We are all imperfect. And no matter how hard I try, I'm going to fall short time and time and time again. I don't need my own righteousness. You know what I need? I need the righteousness of God. And look at what it says in verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You know what we need? The right righteousness. And you know what the right righteousness is? It's Christ's righteousness. Can I tell you this morning? He's the end of the law. Why is he the end of the law? Because he came, and as a human being, he fulfilled the law. He obeyed it perfectly, and he went to a cross because the punishment for sin was death. And on the cross, he died in my place and in your place. And when he died on the cross, he ended the law. And you know why he ended the law? So that his righteousness would be made available to you and me. You know, the righteousness that is required to stand before God isn't my own. It's Christ's righteousness. Righteousness. I need to put off myself. Doesn't matter how good or how clean or what you think of me on the outside. I need something that is outside of myself. I need the righteousness of Jesus. And you know how I get it? By faith. By faith. I've got to recognize that there's absolutely nothing that I can do to save myself. I've got to recognize that I am broken and I am dirty and I am a sinner. And I've got to believe that on that cross, he died to pay for my sins. And I've got got to believe that what he's offering me is what I need, and that is his righteousness. And by faith, I've got to set all of myself out of the way, and I've got to go over there, and I've got to say, I need the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and that's what I go get, and that's what I put on. You understand what we're talking about this morning? That is righteousness by faith. And without Christ's righteousness, there's no heaven. Without Christ's righteousness, there's no intimate relationship with God in this life. Practical application. Stay burdened. Stay burdened. You know what the reality is? People know God, but they don't want the righteousness of Christ. On Tuesday night, Atlanta, I mean, uh, Scarlett and I, we when we have time at home, when there's not games or something like that going on and we get to just have a night at home, some, we like to watch The Voice. And the other night we were watching The Voice and the contestants sang a very popular song this year by a man, an artist by the name of Jelly Roll. How many of you have heard of Jelly Roll before? <laughs> and his song is Need a Favor. I've heard that song before, before that night. The first time I heard that song, it captured my heart and my attention instantly right off the bat. Because you know why? When Jelly Jelly Roll wrote that song and when he sings it, man, he sings it like he means it. And you know, the lyrics to that song are, I only talk to God when I need a favor. And I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. And then in a very colorful way that I'm not going to repeat in church, he says, who am I to deserve a savior? He goes on and he says, I know amazing grace, but I've not been living that way. He goes on to say, he's got a hardcover King James that's just collecting dust on the table. And he knows what's right and he knows what's wrong. He knows God. But by the time he gets on his knees to pray, he doesn't even have a prayer. And he knows that he doesn't deserve a savior. And you know what? There's so much truth in that because even though we know God and even though we've rejected God, God's still loving and he's still merciful and he's still kind and he's still good. And if we humble ourselves and go to him, I'm telling you, he'll be there to answer. But can I tell you, he's still missing the whole entire point. All he wants is a favor. I'll pay for all the sins that I've done. I know that I don't have a right to ask you of anything, and i got to take what I get, but just please do me this one thing. Help me not to lose her. More than you need her. More than you need anything that you think you are looking for. You need Jesus. You need his righteousness. That's all that we've got in this life. 
And that's the whole point. This world knows God and we're so close to God, but yet we're missing it all because what we need is Jesus. Jesus will change everything about our lives, but yet we sell out and we just go to God when we want his favors for him to bless our life. And then we walk away from him time after time after time. And you're gonna keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. I get burdened about this because I was Googling it even today. He he writes another song that's called Son of a Sinner. And he talks in there about how he drinks, pops pills, and and he goes down that road. And then he talks to God, and he talks about the fact that he's living in the middle. And you know what? There are so many Christians that are just living in the middle. You know God. You know you need his righteousness. But yet we're dabbling and we're fooling around with things that will lead to destruction. And here is a popular artist that has been in and out of jail, that is up and down straight fighting with addiction. He's telling you the truth loud and clear for the whole world to hear. And yet he's not quite submitting to what he needs, which is Jesus. We need Jesus. Stay burdened. I think the reason why so many people in the world run away from Jesus is because of the people that are sitting in this room that don't live and act like Jesus. Because we live in the middle. We don't always look like Christ. We don't open our mouth to proclaim the goodness of Christ. We need the righteousness of Jesus, and we got to get a hold of that by faith. Not only do we need righteousness by faith, but we need faith by hearing. Righteousness by faith, faith by hearing. So you might be sitting here and you might be wondering, well, how do you get that righteousness? You get that righteousness by hearing about the righteousness that comes by faith. Already this morning, we've already been proclaiming the truth. We've been doing that exactly. We've been preaching, proclaiming the truth of God's word, the need that every man has in their heart for God's righteousness. It comes by hearing. Now look at the way that Paul uh, plays this out in this chapter. Look at verse 5. He says, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by by them. Paul's quoting Moses right here from Leviticus 18, verse 5. And you know what Moses taught? That if you obey the law, you live. And guess what? Nothing could be truer. If there was a human being that was born that obeyed the law perfectly, you would be righteous. You would be able to stand before God. But not only that, here's what I really want you to see. The flip side of that, not only do you get to live eternally with God, but you live by the law. If you're trying to obey the law of God, if you're living by the truth of God's word, you get to enjoy all the blessings in life that God wants to pour out on you. This book and the rights and wrongs that are in here aren't to make our lives miserable, aren't to rob us of fun. They're the key to unlock the blessings and the security and the true happiness that life has to hold. Nothing could be true. God's law, God's word is perfect. It's for our good. Now look what he says in verses 6 and 7. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. Paul is now quoting directly from Moses again. This time it's in the book of Deuteronomy. And this time Moses is at the very end of his life and he's about to die. And you know what he does? He brings all of Israel together. He gathers them all in and he is imploring them. He's begging them, obey God. If you obey God, God will bless you. If you disobey God, God will curse you. Man, he lays it all out. He's imploring them. He's begging them. And then he says this. It's not as if God is far from you. You don't have to ascend into heaven to find him. You don't have to descend into the deep. You don't have to go into the underworld. You don't have to go into the place of the dead to find him. The word is nigh you, even in your mouth and in your heart. You know the truth. God's given you the truth. And it's always been about penetrating deep into our hearts and into our minds. That's that's what it's always been about. Paul's saying, you, you know what to do. This is, again, why 
They did not submit to the righteousness of God. This, this stuff just didn't add up. It didn't make sense to them. Well, you know what Paul does? He uses these same truths to point to the gospel. Look at verse 8 one more time. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. And everybody read that last phrase out loud with me. That is the word of faith which we preach. You know what Paul is telling us today? It's not as if the righteousness that you need, the righteousness of Christ, it's not far from you. You don't have to ascend into heaven. You don't have to descend into hell. You don't have to go anywhere. It's, it's right here. It's available. It's the word of faith that we're preaching. It's the fact that we're broken and we're sinners and Jesus loved you and he died. And all you got to do is by faith believe on him and you can have his righteousness. It's right here. It wouldn't take more than a couple seconds for anybody, no matter where you're at in this room, to get up and come get the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's not hiding. It's in plain view. You're hearing about it. It's right there. Faith comes by hearing. Here's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with it? You know the practical application from all of this. When we hear, believe and confess. Believe and confess. Look at verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt, what's that next word? Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then jump down and look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what this is saying right here? Faith comes by hearing. The word of faith is being preached and proclaimed. You are hearing it. So what do you need to do with it? You need to believe and you need to confess. Inward belief, outward confession go together. They fit perfectly together. You really cannot have one without the other. Okay, so here's how it works. With the heart, you believe. You've heard the truth this morning. And the reality is you either believe it or you don't. You either believe that you need Jesus and he's your only way of salvation and his righteousness is the only righteousness that will make you be able to stand before God. And if you genuinely believe that in the depths of your heart and your soul, if you believe that, do you believe that this morning? To the believers that are here, do you believe that this morning? Then you're justified. Okay, so that's the inward. That's what saves you. But what's the most natural thing that happens as a result of that? Confession. With the mouth you confess, you make an open and free declaration that you believe. That's what confession is, an open and free declaration of the reality that has taken place in your heart. Can I tell you something this morning? Confession without faith is empty. There are so many people that when they find themselves in a jam, and there have been so many people that I've talked to, there's been so many people that have come to our church through the years that get themselves in a bind and they do exactly what they should do. They run to Jesus. They know the truth. But you know what they do? They're just really ultimately looking for a favor and they might confess with their mouth. You may have prayed a prayer. You may have cried out to Jesus before to save you. But if the belief is not attached in your heart, it is meaningless, it is empty, it is nothing. But the exact opposite is true too. Belief without confession is empty. There are other people that sit and they hear the truth of God's word and they believe it and they know it. The Holy Spirit is talking to you and he's convincing you that it is true what you are hearing, but yet you're scared of what other people will think and you're scared of the changes that might result in your life as a result of it. And you know what you do? You sit there and for the sake of somebody else, you're not willing to make that open and public profession and you end up walking away from the very thing that you need. You know what the second practical application is from this? Don't be ashamed. Look what he says in verses 11 and 12. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich. He's rich unto all that call upon him. Can I tell you what breaks my heart today? There are so many labels in our world. Black and white transgender, gay, lesbian, bisexual. 
male, female, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican. I could go down the list. We could sit here all day and we could throw out labels. And you know what? We live in a sin-cursed world. And as long as we live in a sin-cursed world, labels are going to be highlighted over and over again because Satan is a great divider. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to put division between people. And you know what the gospel is? The gospel is the answer. The righteousness of Jesus is the answer because it doesn't matter how you identify yourself. It doesn't matter how the world identifies you. It only matters how God sees you and he sees you as a human being created in his image and likeness and he loved you enough to go to a cross. And if you call on the Lord, you can become his child. This is the answer. Man, there are so many people that that reject God, but yet they're like, there's a lot of Mother Teresas in this world. They might not necessarily, and I'm not saying, they're, they're not necessarily saying that they don't believe in God, but they don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. They don't believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And you know what they're trying to do? They're out there trying to do good things and to make a profound difference and to bring healing together. Apart from Jesus Christ, there will never be healing. There will only be a broken world. The Lord is rich unto all that believe in him. Believe and confess. And don't be ashamed. You know, when I was talking to to those of you that already believe, because this is heavy salvation, right? This heavy gospel. To those of us who have believed, confess. Open up your mouth and proclaim the good news of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of who he is. Don't be ashamed of your story. Don't be ashamed of your testimony. Don't be ashamed of what he's done in your life. And last but not least, and we are done, hearing by proclaiming. Righteousness by faith, faith by hearing, hearing by proclaiming. Look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call Upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then verses 14 and 15, beautiful. How then shall they call on him who they have not believed? How can the world call on somebody in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? How how can you believe if you don't hear? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring good, uh, glad tidings of good things. My, my first practical application, originally I had down, my first practical application was going to be this, have beautiful feet. But I changed that because my wife takes that very extremely literally. Because you see, she had the opportunity to go and she gets her nails done and every now and then she'll get a pedicure. And for over a year, she was able to witness to her nail lady and her nail lady got saved and trusted in Jesus as her Lord and Savior. So now she tells me all the time, she's got to have beautiful hands and feet because that is her ministry. She's got a new one now that she's working on. So man, every six weeks, got to shell out the money. But you know what? I learned yesterday, that's a win-win, man. I can be a good husband and share the gospel of Jesus Christ at the same time through my wife right there. That's a silly illustration, but seriously, seriously, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Do you believe that? The gospel is... Glad tidings of good things. Surrender to the call. It's the last application, surrender to the call. Paul may have been talking about himself when he was talking about the preachers being sent. And I want to say this this morning. There is no doubt that God places a specific call on the lives of individuals to surrender their entire life, to leave father, mother, houses, and lands, to go to a foreign mission field, to go into full-time service, to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God does place that call, and we need people that are willing to surrender to that call. Can I ask everybody in here to do something this morning? Will you ask yourself if God's calling you? Will you open up yourself to the possibility that God would call you into full-time service, into full-time ministry, maybe to to leave this country, to go to another country, to be a youth pastor, to be somebody that does it full-time because we need servants of God like that. This is, God uses preachers and it's a wonderful call and how beautiful are those who preach the glad tidings of good things. 
I think one reason why we don't have as many people surrendering to the call is because maybe the call isn't going forward, and I'll, I'll take that personally. I need to put that out there every single week. A call, is God calling you? Will you volunteer? Would you be willing to go? There's a world that is lost and dying. What better thing could you invest your life in? You're not gonna mess up that call. It's not like you're gonna get to heaven one day. I don't, this, you don't have to take this one too complicated. It's not like you're gonna get to heaven one day and be like, well, God, I surrendered. I went to mis- the mission field and God's like, that's not really what I had in mind for you. I mean, do you think that's gonna happen? No. So are you open? Is God calling you? Will you pray? Will you examine? Will you do business with God and present your life and say, God, if that's what you want me to do, I'm willing to do it. I'll be obedient. But you know what the other reality to this is? The call has gone forward to every single individual. The last thing Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We've all been given that call. Every single person in here. And unless you surrender to the call, how will they hear? And if they don't hear, how will they believe? And if they don't believe, they won't call on the name of the Lord. And if they don't call on the name of the Lord, if they don't call on the name of the Lord, they perish. Last week, we asked you all at the end of the service to go grab a light bulb. And man, I was blown away by the response. This light bulb is not just a simple light bulb. It represents a person, an individual. Unless they hear, they won't believe. And if they don't believe, they won't call. And if they don't call, they will perish. Are you going to take this serious? I know it's easy when we sit in church sometimes to feel emotional and to get caught up in the moment. But then as we go throughout the week, life just happens to take over. And we go in, our, and I'm t- talking to myself here. We go, get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed. And another day goes by, another week goes by, another month goes by. And have we done anything about that person? Are we burdened the way that Paul is? Do we see the lost world the way that God does with compassion as sheep that have no shepherd? Have you been getting up and going before God every day for an individual this past week? Did you, are you coming to the three circles with an open heart and a humble heart? Just, again, it's not the method, okay? It's just, it's just another tool. It's just another way to be creative and sharing the gospel. The point is, are you stretching yourself? Are you challenging yourself? Are you opening yourself up to the accountability? I want to ask you in some of your connect groups, hey, will you ask but you connect leaders, man, make people accountable. Hold them accountable to the truth of who God is.